Hello, everyone, or good evening from Indonesia. We are so pleased to see that so many of you have followed the invitation to join our webinar. This is the last of our series on decolonizing aid. We had five events all together, and we are so happy to have been given the opportunity to participate in this series of events. And I said it before, it was called or is called decolonizing aid. We discussed many different aspects, even though we could not discuss all questions and could not find all the answers. It's very likely that new questions will appear coming from today's webinar. Questions like, how can we perpetuate those ideas? How can we work on those ideas? Ideas that will accompany us for some time when decolonizing aid. Several ideas have, have already been touched upon. And during today's webinar, the last of our series, we would like to improve or develop new con concepts as to how we can improve the underlying structure. We want to think about how aid and how the concept of aid can be further developed, because this is important against the backdrop of development so that we have a new concept on which we can build aid. And this will affect many people. We need to collect those new ideas to find out what we can implement and what we can work on together in future, such as the idea on the restructuring and deconstruction of language, the narratives behind all that. This is something where we hope we can contribute by setting new impulses and by receiving new impulses today. And hopefully we can wrap up these series with today's webinar by collecting new ideas that we can discuss today and implement later on. I am an organizer of a local initiative working together with Medico International. And as such, I'm honored to have been given the opportunity to conduct these series together. Here, we see firsthand how those colonizing structures are perpetuated within aid. And that is why we're of the opinion that these seminars and our discussions contribute to a new form of international cooperation with the aim of decolonizing aid so that in the end we will get a new concept a concept with which we can conduct that new form of aid so that we can create a new civilization or that those structures can create a new civilization and a better life for all of us. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar. And we hope to get many more interesting insights so that we can develop a structure of aid that is adjusted to the people in need. Thank you very much, uh, dear Lian, 
for your um, entry words. Um, and also from my side, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's um, participating today in our last session of Decolonizing Aid, Planetary Solidarity Beyond Aid. Um, my name is Radwa Khaled Ibrahim. I'm the speaker for Transformative Aid and, uh, Devel and Emergency Relief at Medico International um, here in Frankfurt. And um, it has been really a great journey to uh, work with you, uh, dear Lian, on uh, conceptualizing this uh, series, but also um, in hearing the different perspectives uh, during the last four sessions and now coming to the fifth one and the last and concluding one um, with the questions of abolitionism, or abolitionist justice, what can we learn um, and uh, how can we think it on a global uh, scale as well, considering the questions of aid, but also of the shaping of um, our different ways of living together and being part of this world. Um, so I'm very much looking forward. And I'd also like to say and look back on um, the last uh, sessions, um, especially in the light of uh, what has been um, happening uh, here in Germany, looking from the local perspective also. <laughs> so um, just uh, two weeks ago, the Federal Ministry for Cooperation and Development that's BMZ here in Germany um, wrote its, um, in its new guidelines that the German government is now striving for uh, feminist development politics. This should, among other things, uh, counteract the continuation of the colonial history um, of development cooperation or development aid and reconstruct it. Inherent in this statement is, on the one hand, that development aid is not only part of international relations, but like colonialism from which it sprang as well, it is part of the modern shaping of the world. It not only solidifies power relations, but it shapes them, produces them and shapes its subjects. In our series, we invited activists, aid practitioners and intellectuals from different sites in the global south who, uh, or who are situated through their work transnationally. We learned from the contributions that from a Southern perspective, the project of decolonizing aid and development cannot be reduced to a question of pluralizing the voices and the development institutions and organizations and uh, or diversifying the different ways of those involved in development work as it sometimes is misconceived and carried in other northern discussions. At minimum, decolonizing requires a profound re-examination of the very structures of aid and how it has always been working along capitalist economic structures. Decolonizing asks us to questions or asks us to question and to transform the foundational capitalist structure of development and aid as the roots of global inequality. We learned that decolonizing is a project that is already stuffed with rich and impressive knowledges and practices coming from heterogeneous sites, collectives and activists located in far <laughs> across various sites. For example, the Sufism Tuba being one. Through resistances to official, official, national as well as institutional development policies, through network building and discursive interventions, to alternative knowledge production, they build up their own understanding and practices of decolonization and their very own understandings also of development. So it is not so much the question of how we can think decolonizing development and aid, but rather how can we make sure that the knowledge and the practices that are already crafted in social movements, networks, think tanks, grassroots, communities, etc., are being recognized and acknowledged as such and how can we make sure and create the structures so that we can all learn from these different struggles and transform our um, also very own structures and craft them together. So we learned also that epistemological decolonization in the North cannot be reduced to the recognition of the colonial past as a certain historical period that has passed and cannot be ignored. Epistemological decolonization must go deeper to understand how coloniality is embedded in present politics, structures, and our knowledge, and how it shapes current forms of development cooperation and aid practices, as well as development aid as a field also of knowledge. With the ongoing transformations, especially in terms of climate change politics, there are new forms of neocolonialist and neocolonialism 
that constantly transform and challenge the labor and endeavor that already has been undertaken to decolonize development aid or decolonize aid. But the question is also very present. So in the last sessions of the event series, Decolonizing Aid, Planetary Solidarity Beyond Aid, we explored how power relations and world making are produced also throughout the now more and more dotted idea of decolonization itself. How implications of universalism and cultural relativism in aid make some transformations impossible, but also the relation between them. What does reconstruction mean as a relation and the concrete role of rights in aid? We switched between the conceptual level and the practice. How in the current shifts in geopolitics can the North-South relation should be re-understood? And uh, what is the role of aid in it? What does it mean when Ukraine is seen as part of the global South under the premise of neoliberal capitalism? Which parts of humanitarian aid should, be, should we keep and which should we abolish? And what islands of sanity in aid uh, are there left to continue to ask the big question? Can aid be decolonized? Decolonized? Or is it that itself an oxymoron? From this, we ask the next and, or in the next, or in this session and the last session, we do still need aid if we understand hierarchies and inequalities of systemic injustice and act on them. Can we learn anything, or what can we learn from abolitionist and institution oriented practices, policies, and histories from this? For this, how can we implement aid or something? akin to aid in a communitarian sense, a sense of mutual aid on a global scale. With no further delay, I give over to our moderator and co-speaker of today's session, Vanessa E. Thompson. Vanessa Thompson is an assistant professor of Black Studies at the Department of Gender Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. As an activist and academic, her research and teaching interests include critical racism and migration studies, black studies, intersectional inequality and gender studies, postcolonial and decolonial feminist theories and methodologies, theories and critique of securitization and theories of transformative justice. One of her most recent publication is Abolitionism, a reader, and, and her crucial work with Daniel Loic as um, Can you still hear me? Hello? Okay, I seem to have um, a problem here. So I give over to Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radwa and Lian. Thank you so much. Thank you too so much for organizing and coordinating this crucial and important series. Also, thank you to uh, Tanya and to all the translators who are actually um, working behind the scenes so that we can communicate. And obviously to the whole technical team that, that set this up. Um, I'm very grateful to be part of this and in conversation with you and participants from so many parts um, of the world today. As you already said, uh, Ratwa, the dialogue series um, Decolonizing Aid, Planetary Solidarity Beyond Aid, engages with the multiplications of crisis in our current conjuncture. Crisis which impact folks differently in relation to location, socioeconomic condition, and racialized and gendered hierarchies. So against this background, um, it is crucial to not only analyze the modalities of crisis, but to ground this in an understanding of the source of crisis, as well as in the mobilization towards radical um, transformation and reconstruction. So as we already laid out in the previous session, a focus was put again and again on the colonial continuities of the politics of development. In fact, development can be understood as a neoliberal remodeling of structures of dependency and preservation, as well as stabilization of the status quo. At the same time, various networks and participants have shared practices that are already rehearsing more relational and horizontal forms of cooperation and solidarity, often 
these are not just an utopian future, but are lived in the everyday and in the every when of ordinary people. The contributions from activists, professionals and academics from a broad variety of places on the globe that we all heard in the last uh, pre and previous sessions made very clear that the architecture of development and its institutions is permeated by colonial thinking and colonial power and colonial materialities. And how this architecture actually paves the way for neoliberal development policies and practices. And I would argue that these are actually a part of counterinsurgency, but I will say more on this later. And there's a great deal of alternative knowledges and practices already put in place by communities, networks of activists and social movements in what is today called the global south, but I think that's actually also a term we need to interrogate to promote alternative ways of thinking and doing development. So today's last sessions of this dialogical conversation is dedicated to the question if there is something to learn from abolitionist approaches for the project of decolonizing aid. Abolition is a project with many genealogies and histories, ranging from the Haitian Revolution and the Colombos, where formerly enslaved people run away and created social relations that stand in radical contradiction to the capitalist mode of production and its racist and gendered logics, to anti-colonial projects of liberation, the formation and resistances of people rendered surplus, such as the landless workers in South Africa, criminalized and imprisoned populations, people rendered refugees, and many more. So these projects are in conversation because they had actually only refused the capitalist logic of production, of which obviously also development is a part, um, but actually build something else. They are in conversation with what Audre Lorde said about the master's tools and their relation to the master's house. Her idea was that the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. This inspiration was also crucial for the conception of this series and what this means for the project of decolonizing development and aid. So in this session today, we actually want to ask what is left when we leave the master's house. What can we use from it in terms of an abuse? What can we steal from it to do things radically different? Can and should we save parts of the idea of development and from the idea of aid? What should be transformed? What can we use further? What kind of practices are already in place, not as an utopia, but as lived conditions that are rehearsed in the everyday? What needs to change so that we can radically engage in solidarity instead of aid projects? So we will reflect on these and more questions today and collectively and are grateful that LATA has agreed to prepare an input on the relation between development studies and decolonization and the question if and how critical knowledge production in the global north can in fact make any significant contribution to decolonizing development and aid. So regarding our structure, um, uh, uh, Lata, and I will introduce uh, Lata Narayana Swami briefly, um, will give an input. And I will then add some brief reflections to ground this or to, to actually open up a bit the conversation, what this has to do maybe with abolition. And um, then we'll have a fishbowl conversation. And I will say more about the fishbowl um, later after the presentation and the reflections. But I already invite you um, to actually, you can already during the, um, during the talks actually note in the chat or by raising your hand that you would like to be put on the list for, uh, for the fishbowl. So you don't have to wait actually until our presentations and reflections are over, you're invited to already um, raise your hand or say something in the chat so that our moderator, uh, Denise, 
who is great for me actually organizing uh, the moderation and supporting with the moderation can put it um put your name on the list um so that we collect um and choreography the the participations a bit already a bit so Lata Narana Swami is associate professor in politics of global development at the University of Leeds, England. Her research interests include the decolonization of development, the nexus of gender and development, and the relationship between knowledge production and development. She's also part of the Coast Acting Decolonizing Development Research Teaching and Practice the Water Security and Sustainable Development Hub, and the Gender and Information Ecosystems in Climate Change Adaption Projects. And I'm actually not um, delving into all of her crucial publications, but you'll find her online, and I really encourage you to engage um, with her brilliant and also collaborative work, um, really engaging in so many um, radical transformative projects. So um, Lata, I hand over the floor to you. If I may just hijack for a very brief moment, because um, we are also so very happy to have you both in conversation. And it was uh, quite unlucky for the more technical um, problems that I was not able to properly introduce you, Vanessa. So allow me to um, also highlight again your work and um, your very crucial and important, um, uh, yeah, and in, in, in different impulses and um, questions that you are reading and also you are working through. So allow me to do that again <laughs> for a second. So um, Vanessa E. Thompson is an assistant professor and distinguished professor in Black Studies and Social Justice at Queen's University in Canada. She researches and teaches in the areas of Black Studies, Critical Racism and Migration Studies, Gender Studies anti-colonial theories and methodologies and critical ethnographies. She is particularly interested in engaging and engages with uh, transnational black urban and social movements, struggles against state violence and policing, as well as abolition geographies and socialities. Vanessa continues to collaborate with abolitionist collectives in Europe, as well as transnational abolitionist movements. And her recent publications, from which I learned a lot, and I actually learned really a lot from Vanessa because um, she was also working at the University of Frankfurt when I was a student there. So um, I'm so glad to um, be with, with you right now in this different um, constellation. So um, her recent publications uh, are Abolitionismus and Reader, Abolitionism, a Reader, um, from Surkamp um, in 2022, uh, published there, and uh, Black Feminism. The S in um, brackets, um, 2021, published with Feminine Politica. So again, sorry for hijacking and so excited to um, listen to both of you. And um, yeah, so Lata, the floor of yours is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you to Medico International for the invitation. Thank you. Um, Radwa and Vanessa uh, Leanne for that very generous um, introduction and I really do see myself trying to set up a conversation really really looking forward to hearing from you uh, Vanessa and um, learning together so please see what I'm saying as the start of a conversation um, and I never ever intend anything I say to be the last word on anything ever we only ever learn when we listen to each other and we only ever work things out when we listen to each other. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I've been a little bit ill this week. Um, so if I suddenly start coughing, don't worry, I'm fine. Um, but the invitation was too good to miss. And um, um, I'm carried through by the uh, solidarity and commitment of uh, lovely fellow hosts and panelists. So let me just share my screen. And I will, so hopefully what you're seeing now is my whole screen. Great, okay. So what I'm hoping to do uh, today is just to respond to the provocation really in thinking about what decolonization might mean in terms of how we understand the way the world 
works. And I'm hoping that in my 20 minutes, I'll be able to start a conversation around what this looks like in the real world and actually setting out the ways in which the language itself is being co-opted to make us feel as if we are starting to solve these problems, but in ways that are never really getting to the root of the problems that we are uh, being affected by that lots of that you have already set out really helpfully and eloquently um, in the introduction to this session. Um, that some of those uh, dialogues and solidarities and movement building is already occurring around imagining another way for the world to be. Pardon. And Nata, just yep. briefly, because I think we cannot, we can still not see your your presentation. Oh, hang on a second. Yeah, you could try to pull that up again. Sorry for for. Um, no, no, not at all. Yes, no. I think I forgot. I think I forgot to hit share. Perfect. We can see it now. I hadn't moved any slides, so it's fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So basically, all I wanted to do was just to set out a provocation that allows us also to deal honestly in how these issues are being talked about in the space of aid, you know, and what decolonization kind of isn't and shouldn't be. Um, and then I hope in the fishbowl we can sort of tease some of these out and work through what we do about it, um, because I think making it tangible in the everyday is really, really important. Okay, so I know that there have been a number of events and lots of things have been covered, but I think it's important for me personally, and I, as I said, there are uh, upsetting images and I don't share these lightly, but I feel that the danger of decolonizing is that there's still a tendency to talk about decoloniality as if it's something that is about brown and black bodies somewhere else, that this isn't something to do with us in the West, or it's about minoritized bodies in the global north. And I share these images because they really should be affecting all of us. And that coloniality, not just European colonialism, but that the way it exists now in our lives is something about all of us, right? So colonialism is everybody's story. We all have to care and it affects every single one of our lives, right? So there's no exception to that. There's nobody that sits outside of that matrix of power and the ways in which they interact in our lives. So for me, that's really important in terms of setting out the stall for why we come together today. And it's certainly an issue for me in the sense of the way the decoloniality gets talked about is very much about, it's an, there's still an othering that goes along with it. Oh, we have to think about Africa differently, or we have to think about Asia differently, or we have to think about equality, diversity, and inclusion. And that's only ever about minoritized bodies in the global north. And my plea to you is the starting point has to be coloniality is our story, our shared story, and it, it is about everybody. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm interested then in thinking about the system that we live in. And I'm struck by the fact that we are in a system, it's continually reinventing itself, Lots and lots of very loud um, interlocutors, if you like, who are always saying that, no, 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 here is the big solution for the problems that we're facing now. So we are always only the source for all the problems that when we look at the system as it exists, it's this system that's caused the problems in the first place. So our starting point is already a little bit problem, more than a little bit problematic. We're claiming to be the source of solutions for the, pro the system is claiming to be the source for solutions for the problems that it actually caused in the first place. Now, why that matters to us now, then is to think about not just European coloniality in a very narrow sense, it has affected everybody on the planet, but what's much more interesting is to think about neocolonialism so lots of people have written on it, but here I'm uh, keen to draw on Atwiri and Rutazibwa because I think this is a really eloquent kind of summary of the, of the situation. And it implicates, again, all of us in the reproduction, the production and the reproduction of what we might call the sort of neo-colonial 
ways in which our lives exist and the system both produces and reproduces itself. Right. So colonization models are perpetuated by fellow citizens, by former colonizers, by external actors and through institutions of global governance. So for me, this is really, really important. There is a historical reckoning that has to happen and we can and should be talking about that. And I, and I think we will be probably in the fishbowl today. And I think there's something there are important discussions going on about reparations, about reimagining aid. And that's about historical harm, and there are lots of people talking about that. I think in a way, what we are less good at doing is talking about neocoloniality, that somehow that's something that happened a long time ago that we have to uh, uh, account for, but we're not really thinking through what that means for us today, or we're doing less of that, because obviously that's a very challenging conversation to have, because it's very fundamentally challenging to the way that we live. And a lot of the vested interests who have um, who are very keen for the system to continue as it is because they benefit from it. OK, now one of the charges then, and it's this is really more about making clear what exactly we are up against. Now, some of you may be familiar with this video, but this was um, uh, 14th of October 2022. So it's not that long ago. And one of the ways in which this whole idea of decoloniality and why I think it's important to think in terms of neocolonialism is this comment. So I'd like you to hear um, this excerpt from a speech given by Joseph Borrell. Europe. It's a garden. We have built a garden. Aggressive works. It's the best combination of a political freedom, economic prosperity, and social cohesion that the humankind has been able to build. There's these things together. The, the rest of the world, and you know very well, Federica is not exactly a garden. The rest of the world, most of the rest of the world is the jungle. And the jungle could invade the garden and the gardeners should take care of it, should take care of the garden, but they will not protect the garden by, by walls, by building walls. A nice small garden surrounded by high walls in order to prevent the jungle coming in is not going to be a solution because the, the jungle has a strong growth capacity and the world will never be high enough in order to protect the garden. The gardeners have to go to the jungle. The Europeans has to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. Otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us by different ways and means. Yes, this is my most important message. We have to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. We are privileged people who build a combination of these three things, political freedom, economic prosperity, social cohesion. Now. You might hear that and you might think, OK, well, who is this? And this is a political rally or, um, you know, not a shared view. I would like for those of you who don't know who this is, this isn't a political party message. This is the European Commission's vice president in charge of coordinate, coordinating the external action of the European Union. So he is the European Union's most senior bureaucrat. So at least in theory, this is somebody who is supposed to be politically neutral. And I share this speech for a number of reasons. But so the first is, I think it really encapsulates what we're up against in terms of what we're up against in terms of thinking about, oh, sorry, what we're up against in terms of thinking about the way in which people who have power understand how the world works. So this speech is very good at encapsulating the ways in which it places Europe, 
thought of as homogenous, right? At the top. And the rest of the world is a jungle and it's trying to invade. Um, the jungle has growth capacity. So you've got really lovely kind of racist notions of population control baked in there. And this is not something that he said a long time ago. And the funniest thing is he actually made the same speech the year before in 2021. He only got caught out the second time. So there is something important happening in terms of raising awareness around how these ideas exist and how it, they're becoming less and less uh, um, acceptable and that people are pushing back. But this is the ways in, this is the way in which so many people understand how the world actually exists and functions. That there is uh, a need for something called development and aid from a civilized, ordered garden to a disordered, unruly, barbarous jungle, right? And that for me is absolutely pure coloniality. There's no two ways about that. Now, it's important to note he was called out on it. He did apologize, but he didn't really apologize. What he did is he said that he wasn't racist and he didn't, it was misinterpreted. Um, and this is actually somebody who's politically supposed to be on the left, if you like. So we mustn't make assumptions about where or how the, the people who we might seem to even be uh, progressive in their politics are necessarily thinking in the same ways. So there is a sort of collective awareness raising advocacy element to the jobs that we're doing, one of which is this kind of event, an opportunity to come together and actually talk through the implications of powerful actors continuing to harbor worldviews such as this. What is the damage that they do? And I think in my view, it's considerable, but this is what we're up against. And it's really important to understand that that's the case. Okay, so what's important then is to understand what the response has been to this kind of worldview. And I think it's really important to be honest about that before we work out what we do about it. You know, and I think Vanessa is going to come in and I can't wait to hear what you've got to say about um, different so alternative futures. But I think it's really important that there is movement in this sector, but a lot of it is getting a little bit muddled. And we need to be clear about what where that model is occurring. So the first thing has been, OK, well, to decolonize, we must diversify. This could be reading lists. This could be. Um, uh, you know, diversifying, and I know you've talked a little bit about that in this series already. But in the context of knowledge and thinking about how we know the world, the sorts of theories that underpin how we know the world, this doesn't seem an entirely unreasonable demand, right? Because it's the Adam Smiths and the Thomas Malthuses and the Karl Marxes and the John Maynard Keynes and the Friedrich Hayek's and the Michel Foucault's that shape how we know the world. And we also know, and I say this sitting in a, nor in a global North elite university, the colonial enterprise itself was a lens or even a laboratory to test ideas around modernity that took at its core the establishment of the native other to justify the colonial enterprise and its main mechanisms of land expropriation and universalizing, for instance, enlighten enlightenment principles against a perceived barbarism. So there is an important critique to be had about where we draw our ideas about how the world works. And these are the ideas that are in turn underpinning the sorts of decisions that are made about where and how power exists, how it's used, on whom it is exerted, where it circulates, who is and isn't allowed to have a voice. Even though we might, and, and it's often articulated in a, in, a, in a very reductive way, sort of dead white men. And I, and I see, and I can understand, I look at the slide and I think, yeah, I kind of understand that. I get why you might feel that instinctively. But I think this is lazy, right? We need to move beyond thinking it's enough to simply change the race, gender, or status of the messenger, and instead raise more fundamental questions about the message. Yes, these are all white men, but it would be absurd to think that they all think the same thing. And so we need to be much more careful when we think about what we're talking about in terms of diversity. And for me, I feel like this is still an ongoing project 
And there's a danger of being quite reductive that we say, okay, well, and it gets interpreted as, oh, I'm not interested in what these people have to say. I'm going to draw on somebody else. And actually, I don't think that's that is what decoloniality can and should mean. I think we need to think carefully about what brings us together and why we are challenging dominant knowledge structures. And if these are the things, so for instance, we can think about whether these thinkers are drawing on other people. So there's lots of really interesting scholarship around um, where some of the big people, the big thinkers in our social science canon, for instance, got their ideas. Um, that includes the erasure of indigenous knowledge. Now, those are much more interesting conversations to have, but we tend not to have those so readily. There tends to be the sort of coming back on these thinkers or on, and, and sort of dead white men. We need to get rid of the dead white men. It doesn't tend to be what people who think about decoloniality are actually thinking anyway. And we need to be much more nuanced in our critique. Now, the other response is, OK, well, we'll make a checklist. OK, so we'll we'll work out what we're doing right, and what we're doing wrong, and we'll tick some boxes and then we can sort out. We can start thinking about decoloniality that way. But here I want to draw attention to how we know in development itself and its institutions. And here, and, and this is something that's come out, I've drawn on in my own work quite a lot in thinking about not knowledge hierarchies and development. And one of the things that becomes very challenging is that institutionally, we really struggle to think about knowledge outside of the boundaries within which knowledge gets framed. So here I'm talking about the fact that we exist in academic institutions and in global governance institutions. Um, uh, in hierarchical professionalized spaces. Now, one of the things that I'm deeply appreciative of of our session today is the fact that live translation is being made available. I would like to think this is the norm, but it is in fact very, very, very much the exception, right? But I would also point out the fact that at the end of the day, the default is still English, right? There's lots and lots of other languages represented in this space, but I know from my personal experience that I can show up to any event and nobody expects me to speak any language other than English. This is just a fact. So when we think and, 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 and theorize and conceptualize in the English language, that has consequences for who is allowed to be involved, whose voices count, and which ideas that we actually take up. We also exist in structures that are competitive and not collaborative. And here I can think of both NGOs and higher education always competing for funding, the funding bids that and, and these are important mechanisms because that's how we um, get money to do the work we're, we're, we're committed to doing. That's how we sometimes if you're in an NGO, that's how you pay salaries. There are livelihoods at stake if you don't get that money. But then that has consequences. It takes up time. It actually makes collaboration harder because you're actually having to compete in order to get this pot of money to continue doing the things that you believe in doing. The other things that we're always pushing against is the politics of development knowledge, where we don't actually really even think about knowledge as a politicized thing at all. We actually see it as a sort of technical thing. Oh, but if we can just get a school built, if we can just dig that well, or we can just put in place this or that infrastructure, actually that's going to solve the problems of this community or that region. And it's not to suggest that technical things aren't an issue. Maybe schools are good or wells are good. I'm not suggesting those are bad things. But when they are done without an understanding of a political context about whose voices or knowledges actually count when those decisions are being made, in my mind, we are never ever gonna solve those problems. I've already talked a little bit about the language of our practice, but it's not just English. It's a particularly professionalized English. So here I talk about the ways in which words like gender and governance travel very, very poorly outside the English language to the point where they actually just get translated in alliterated ways. <coughs> And we are reliant on particular validation processes. So things have to be published as books. They have to be published as peer reviewed articles. Um, you know, they have to be produced as a PDF and put on a website. Otherwise, nobody takes you seriously. We don't put faith in oral testimony. We don't think about knowledges that are actually handed down through communities. We don't see those as legitimate knowledges. And I'll come back to that in a minute. 
There's also a tendency to universalize Western frameworks. And here again, the charge of the dead white men does have validity in the sense that the canon, as we would call it, this narrow set of ideas that we draw on does tend to be disproportionate, overrepresented by white men. But having said that, the, the ideas that have that longer term validity tend to be very, very narrow and they are universalized. And then there's the homogenizing tendencies of development labels, and I'll come back to that um, in a minute as well. So then we have we end up with something like the SDGs, where we get goals expressed in this way that are really, really actually quite ambitious in lots of important ways. But the danger here is that they're very reductive. It sort of sees the world as a level playing field and everybody can strive towards these goals. And I think one useful conversation could be whether things like the SDGs actively help in our activism. I'm not entirely convinced. I'd be interested to know what others in the space uh, think today. But I think for me, the danger is, again, the sort of reductive tendencies of um, uh, goals like the SDGs, where we're then not able to look at the nuances of whose voices and views and knowledges do or don't count when these sorts of ideas are formulated. Now, the most popular one, of course, is let's localize. Okay, I'm going to um, make sure that, you know, most of the money is spent in the so-called global south. So, Vanessa, your skepticism at that term was well expressed and, 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 and um, well received. Thank you for that. It's very much a critique that I'm, I'm keen on and in the midst of developing at the moment. Um, and I'm sure there are a number of you in the audience who are also in that space. But who or where is the global south? So the danger here is that the global south is also not homogenous. And attempts to privilege alternative southern based views are confronted with two key concerns in my view, which is that um, things like value for money uh, and ideas around how aid is spent and money is still framed within um, the power structures of global governance organizations, which is um, exclusively um, within power centers in what we would call the global north. And although we want to privilege the, vo the voices and ideas, peoples and publications of the global south, the global south has experts too. It is also a profoundly unequal place, just like everywhere. And in many instances, manifesting the gender, race, sexuality, marital status, inequalities that are also directly and indirectly related to colonial legacies. But we are in danger of thinking about the global south as this sort of reified place where we're going to find alternative and subversive development paradigms ideas, simply by uh, paradigms and ideas, simply by virtue of being in and of the global south. And I would argue that that's a little bit naive because where is the local? It re-homogenizes black and brown others and it keeps the structures of aid intact and perpetuates an image of the global south as underdeveloped and dependent on the global north. And here would be my last sort of note of caution, really, which is that we can and should be thinking about all of those ideas and knowledges that have been systematically erased because of that, the, the, the European colonialism and then the subsequent sort of neo-coloniality that we've talked about. But the worry here for me is that we're also in danger of sort of creating a kind of tendency for these ideas like Ubuntu or Buen Vivir, which have really important things to tell us. They become fixed space alternatives. They become codified as indigenous and it reinforces the sort of othering rather than these ideas becoming being part of dynamic knowledge systems that are also adapting and interacting with any so-called mainstream. So these are also not fixed ideas. They're also moving on. And this is something that I have written about elsewhere. So for me, knowledge, whose knowledge counts in our development, research and practice, we need to ask about the ethics of our activities. So people like Linda Tuhi Y. Smith sort of saying, we shouldn't think that as researchers, somehow we are uniquely placed to do this work. We must also be asking, maybe we shouldn't, we're not even the right persons to be asking these questions in the first place. We need to resource the life cycle of activities. That includes, you know, things like co-curation and production, as I said, it's really lovely to see the translation going on in this space today, but it's very, very, very exceptional. It tends not to happen at all. And we're very bad at medium to longer term planning. 
And I'm very keen that we challenge North South knowledge representations. But for me, the starting point of our deliberations has to be about contending with power. What kind of life do people want? What do we mean when we talk about like women's voices? Which women, where, what exactly are we trying to achieve? You know, whose ideas about sustainable development or gender count? Who gets to decide what progress or empowerment looks like? So I'll stop there. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm really looking forward to the fishbowl and to all of your comments as we take forward what I hope is the start of a really lively conversation. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, Lata, for this very thought provoking and generative um, input, I think, which really gratefully starts us off with so many um, important and crucial reflections and also critiques also attuning to um, the possibilities. I was asked by the organizers to briefly prepare a kind of short response from an abolitionist perspective. And, but do with course of time, I'm really trying to make this fast so that we have more time for, or like at least 25 minutes. So I'm trying to, um, I prepared something, so bear with me. I'm trying to rather distill some of the major points. Um, when the organizers actually asked me what could be a kind of abolitionist approach to the question of development and aid, I was wondering, okay, maybe it's good to recapitulate again what ab abolition actually is, because there's not just one definition, it's a whole genealogy of struggle. But I think if we would have to say what are some of the main characteristics, I think there, there is a double movement. One is the, it's the project of, it is also a project of negation, abolishing the modes of productions and relations that make exploitative systems and violent institutions such as prison, borders and police, but also soft power institutions, right? That maintain the status quo, like the university or the school, um, or other kind of welfare institutions and development, I think would also belong to that side, redundant. So examples of this are obviously the Haitian revolution, right? The masses of people abolishing the plantation economy as a system of super exploitation, that was abolition. Anti-colonial movements struggle to abolish colonial capitalism, not just as a racist system, but as a system that is dependent on less than free and unfree labor, often racialized. Um, that was abolition. Radical black and brown movements in the 1960s and various other movements, because abolition is not just a color phenomenon, engaged also in global revolution and struggled to overturn the systems that we're actually coming up against. So abolition is part of a long struggle for liberation. But more importantly, and that's why I'm saying it's a double movement, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore argues, abolition is presence. It is a double-sided project as it builds on the many transformative projects and practices that are already in the world. The alternatives projects that people put forward to not only organize their survival, but that actually open the horizon for radical transformation. Um, and I think Lata already puts it so importantly with regards that it's not just what's the color of the skin of these people, but actually what do these projects looks like, look like, right? Like how are they also already in conversation with building new worlds so that it's not just an essentialist kind of outlook we have on this. Abolition is, pre is not absence, said, says Ruth Wilson Gilmore. It is presence. What the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces experiments and possibilities. So those who feel in their gut deep anxiety that abolition means knock it all down, scorch the earth and start something new, let that go. Abolition is building the future from the present in all the ways we can. I can maybe talk about some of these lived examples more in the fishbowl, but I think when I already said like it's ranging from Haitian revolution to Quilombo formations, Maronage projects, but also practices of what, for instance, the Black Panthers for Self-Defense did, many, many radical movements, what today the landless workers movements are doing actually to really trying to build um, transformative, uh, transformative projects, life-affirming projects, right? So um, now in relation to this, I want to share maybe four very brief, I thought reflections, but now it's rather really 
um, sentences. Um, what does this mean with relation to development and aid? So the first is, I think, related to the role of institutions, of institutions of counterinsurgency, including development studies and projects. Because when we consider the transition from anti-colonial solidarity to aid, something that Thomas Sankara already warned about this, and the development of the NGO industrial complex, or what we call NGOization, as well as the development industrial complex, we have to ask if the abolition of this complex is the only valid answer to the task of decolonizing development. Because I would argue that actually development policies and politics are part of a project of neoliberal counterinsurgency. And what I mean by that is that they're actually there to pass and to, to kind of pacify and de-radicalize um, the projects of resistance and the projects of building other worlds. Right, And I'm thinking with the, the abolitionist Dylan Rodriguez here, who says that there are many counterinsurgency projects um, and a lot of the philanthropic uh, institutions belong to this, but often also education, instit education institutions. If we just think of the academic industrial complex, right, how it often serves to de-radicalize also thinking and pacifying it. So with regards to knowledge production, I'm very hesitant towards the project of decolonization for exactly the, the, the reasons that Lata mentioned, not because I have a problem with decolonization, because what we see in, is actually happening of how various institutions are actually um, avoid, avoiding out that term, like making it empty, neutralizing it, right? We see it with decolonization of the curricula and boards in manuals and buildings. Like suddenly, as we know, knowledge is important, but it's obviously not the only thing. So we have all these kind of discussions going on, but the real colony, the material colony stays in place, right? So we have the call for decolonize this or that, or that and this. Um, but actually the modes of, of surplusification, the severe poverty actually increases and is not even tackled by this. So, and that's I think important because the academic institutions are not engines for social transformation as Robin, by themselves, as Robin D.G. Kelly reminds us, organizing is. Abolition is not an institutional project. So I think because we know that so many struggles for self-determination and radical transformation are happening everywhere and every when, and we just have to think of the major strikes of peasants and students in India during the, the corona crisis, the black rebellions um, after the murder um, of, of George Floyd, the rebellions and protests in Haiti, the self-organizing of refugee movements and people that stand in solidarity, the alternative health projects that people for, put forward, the struggles for climate debt, and for the abolition of debt towards radical reparation and redistribution. So a lot is really uh, already there and is put forward, especially often by women in non-binary communities, um, as the African feminist Hakima Abbas also reminds us. And these are practices that actually re radically reground um, in, in the collectivization of value and labor, protecting the earth and the environment, developing real alternatives to also uh, crime and abuse, for instance. So aligning with these struggles and their demands, I think, was, must, is always an abolitionist principle. So it must be one main principle of the question of the decolonizing uh, development. Critical NGOs or the formations that can develop in these spaces, I think, instead of acting like firefighters, should play a more active role in struggle, especially through putting pressure on governments and supporting struggles without hijacking them. Now, finally, what does this mean for folks who work in these institutions? And this includes myself, obviously, as I work in a university, which is also a very violent neoliberal um, institution that is often complicit with murderous regimes. If we think of the border regimes of the military industrial complex and what have you, or just the social reproduction of inequality, right? So as theories of the undercommons argue, it means steal what you can. 
be an agent of radical redistribution and be part of countering the epistemic counterinsurgency, rather call it study of underdevelopment then, in the spirit of Walter Rodney, and be a part of insurgent knowledge projects that are tied to the material conditions and struggles of people. Maybe an abolitionist device can be of help for this. The distinction between reformist and non-reformist reforms or abolitionist reforms. Departing from the concept of the radical thinker André Gortz, elaborated in his work, A Strategy for Labor, abolitionists use this distinction between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms as a compass in our everyday struggle. Now, reformist reforms, for instance, are those reforms that actually perpetuate the systemic logics and lead to the expansion of resources and power of corporations, philanthropic projects, and carceral states. And non-reformist reforms or abolitionist reforms, on the other hand, are those strategies and demands we put forward that actually strengthen radical community projects and self-organization as counter-hegemonic projects. So defund the police, for instance, is such a strategy, or abolish debt or radical redistribution of wealth. And I'm wondering if this kind of, you know, device, abolitionist device can be helpful also with regards to the question of development aid and abolition. Um, and this then also means that we should not incorporate all radical knowledges into the NGO industrial complex, right? But rather find maybe sometimes ways of how to redistribute resources without um, kind of hijacking that knowledge. Because I think some of, the, some of the knowledges have to be preserved and they have to be also shielded from co-optation and from de-radicalization. But I'll stop here because obviously we're very, very eager to engage with people um, that, that are listening and hopefully also participating. Um, as this is a fishbowl, you have actually various possibilities to be in conversation and comment or question or share your reflections and thought. Um, so there are various forms how you can do that. You can raise your hand on the hand symbol, which you would see down uh, at the, actually there should be a sign um, that when you click on that, then you can raise your hands, but you can also write in the comment sections and you can let um, our moderating support Denise know if you would like to speak or if you would just like us to hear your audio or if you would like to write in the chat. So you have really a, a different possibilities to, uh, with regards to how much, um, how closely, or if you want us to see you, or if you just want to, you know, share your voice. Um, please say when you begin to speak in which language you will speak, so that the translators can um, can prepare themselves. And please also try to speak a bit um, slower so that the translators um, can follow. So the floor is open for our fishbowl. Um, I know that we started, I think even 10 minutes later. So I'll definitely try to adjust to that if that's okay um, with everyone. But um, here goes. Um, we hope that some folks um, would like to share their reflections and thoughts um, and engage in conversation. Okay, I'm just seeing that. Um, okay, thank you. I see there's a question from Aram. I know Denise, you will um, write to me if, if about the movements about, around questions and, um, and comments. So um, Aram Ziai is asking um, or is actually writing in the chat. Uh, Thanks for the great inputs, dear Lata and Vanessa. I agree very much that the whole development industry arose from counterinsurgency efforts of the US against anti-colonial and communist revolutions. But how do we deal with the diagnosis that some of these efforts have had positive consequences on the lives of peoples? Um, I don't know, uh, Lata, if you would like to say something on this first and then. Uh, um, thank you, Vanessa. So the first thing to say is that I'm just really nice that you're here. <laughs> and um, Adam's probably a better person to answer his own question, um, but he's very generous to ask it. 
um, to think that I might have something to say <clears throat> um, at all in relation to this this question. So thanks, Adam, for being here. Um, who is himself a professor of post-colonial development studies, but anyway. Um, but it is an important question. And actually, I remember somebody asking me, you know, it's it's all good to say that, I don't know, SUVs are bad for the planet. But when you've been setting out a sort of aspirational lifestyle includes, you know, having a vehicle and having your own home or or particular ways of living your life that then become available to many millions of people because of some of these movements, some of these shifts in our global political economy, it's actually a little bit rich to turn around and go, oh, actually, sorry, we've decided that that's bad. You know, you can't have that anymore. You can't have your car or your, you know, your house or your picket fence or whatever we're saying is, even though, A, the West never wants to shift on those things, right? Nobody's asking Americans to do without their SUVs or their picket fences or their air conditioning. Um, or their nuclear weapons. And so so we do end up in a, in a quite a difficult place where there will be, there is a growing sort of middle class, if you like, in lots of parts of the world, um, burgeoning middle classes sort of saying, well, actually, this thing we're calling development is kind of working for us. So the fact that an underclass is emerging isn't really our problem. Or I vote and I pay taxes, so that's their problem. So I think there's, I think it's a really important question, and actually goes to the heart of why I wanted to take, I wanted to take head on, sort of the ways in which decoloniality is being interpreted, because I think the sort of technocratic approach to decoloniality is in danger of not getting to grips with these sorts of questions. So what we end up with is a lot of um, animosity towards the idea. Whereas, first of all, to, and I should have said this first, Vanessa, I thought your contribution was amazing and so many important things that you said. Um, but for me, the highlight was the fact that you're starting from the present, right? That for me was what so resonated for me, right? We're not trying to turn back the clock, which is so much of where the sort of pushback on decolonial, oh, you can't rewrite history, blah, blah. And it's like, that's not what we're trying to say. Actually, let's start from the present. What is it that we actually are doing now? What are those movements, like you suggested? What are they saying now? How do we respond to, you know, um, the carcerality of the global political e economy, as it sounds, for instance? How do we actually think about, you know, the rules that we make and then who and how they get policed? You know, how do we push back? I mean, Borrell's words are interesting mainly because he felt really comfortable saying them, right? That says something really important about the for, the ways in which um, people will defend quite vociferously the way the world works now. And it's not enough to come back with a clever argument and say, oh, no, no, but, you know, there's this knowledge here and this knowledge there. We do need, as you say, we need movements. We need to be joining forces and saying, actually, there are different and better ways to live. But I think Adam's question is so important precisely because it gets to the heart of that pushback. Yeah, but we've made people's lives better. And, and there are some things I think, yeah, let's do more potable drinking water. Let's do, you know, piped sewage. Let's do those things. But there are other things that we need to be able to tease them out and say, well, actually, those things are good. But actually, some of these things mean that our planet's literally not livable. And, you know, where and how do you have those conversations when there are so many vested interests? Thank you so much, Lata. I really, this really, I think this really pins it down. And thank you, Aram, uh, for your question. Um, and shout out to um, to Aram on this, uh, on this uh, occasion. I think it's maybe just briefly because i think this whole question of counterinsurgency which obviously many abolitionists but i think dylan in his work dylan rodriguez particularly lays out really um great and i think the the issue here is yes even if and that's definitely a point that also conditions of people have been made better i think we should never ever be confident with the lesser evil right or the lit i mean welfare capitalism is also maybe a better form of neoliberal capitalism but there was always the distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor so actually really going with that kind of mode is going to be part of a selective process and the kind of um 
distinct distinction between the deserving and the undeserving, right? And that's where abolitionist is really important because it actually, actually really engages with those that are rendered undeservable, those that are rendered surplus, particularly the, the criminalized, what folks would call lump and proletariat and, and what have you. So I think that allows for us to demand for, um, for a, a totality with regards to radical transformation. I know that um, there are further questions or contributions and reflections in the chat. Um, Denise, I know one person wanted to, uh, has uh, raised a hand. Yeah, that's correct. The first person who raised their hand um, is Uta and we will be able to hear her uh, soon. And we also encourage everyone to continue raising their hands, participate in our discussions with questions, ideas, anything you had. But now Uta, um, you can speak with us. Ja, ich werde in Deutsch sprechen für die Übersetzerinnen. I would like to speak German. So, hello everyone. Hi Vanessa. Hi Alate. Thank you so much for these inspiring talks. Vanessa has already answered my question. I was trying to concretize something Arab wanted to know. Radwa, in the very beginning, said that this is a very German, albeit topical question regarding the feminist foreign policy. This is a very specific form of concretizing the dilemma we talked about. I try to come up with counter arguments wherever I can, because this describes a story in a very specific point in time, not a coincidence at all. As I see it now in the middle of this war in Ukraine, there is a massive effort to launch feminist perspectives of foreign and security policy, which for the first time in the history of institutionalized policy claims to be intersectional considering diversity, being transformative. This is what they include. This is rather problematic in light with the contradictions that you enlarged upon. So what I usually say is the following. It's a question going back to what Aram wanted to know. Couldn't we just say that this is highly dangerous because in a global geopolitical perspective, this is a completely new question. There are new feminist movements in the world which are highly important. Now the institutions are coming to claim this was theirs as if no one else has ever voiced that before. This is one thing. The other thing is the following. Can't it be denied to say, or let me rephrase it, what Vanessa said, what both of you said, you, you mentioned the undercommons to steal whatever you can because it's possible. So in an institutionalized process, this is something you are allowed to do, things you can steal because you can. Thank you, Jutta. Okay, thank you very much, Jutta, um, for this crucial, uh, yeah, I, I think there's so much to say on this. Also with regard to the genealogy, obviously, of intersectionality and various forms of critiques that are, by the way, also not new. We've been having this conversation in Marxist feminist circles since like 20 years or even longer. Also, there's a kind of reformulation of it in the German context, I think, over and over again. But um, yeah, I don't know, Lata, I will. So I think maybe you would like to say something briefly to Uta's question, and then I will collect some questions because I know I just, I'm just seeing that actually the, the discussion in the chat is also becoming more, more lively. Um, maybe you want to respond, uh, Lata, or share your reflections, and then I'm going to try to pull together some questions. Yes, thank you, um, Uta, for, for your contribution. I was listening on the, the 
very helpful translation. So I got, I'm glad you got to express that in German and that I was having to listen to the translation and think about it. That's a nice, nice position to be in for a change. Um, so um, it's interesting because, I mean, for me, for me, feminist foreign policy, like the whole feminist foreign policy, like industry for me, <laughs> Because Sweden has done it, Canada's done it. I mean, when Canada does it, I think because Justin Trudeau says it, it seems somehow more compelling, maybe because everybody likes him, he's young, he's handsome. I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, but I do think it's very, it's very much, a, it's just very much a checklist tool for me. It's very much a signal, right? It, 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 is, it is almost meaningless as far as I'm concerned, right? If you aren't going to disinvest from carceral capitalism, as Vanessa would say in a much more authoritative way than I can, but it's the only thing I can really think of. Um, so I do think I would defer to Vanessa on this, but I'll just make this one point. And that is that unless you're disinvesting from carceral capitalism, which Germany, Sweden, and Canada definitely are not doing, Feminist foreign policy is exactly what drove the invasion in Afghanistan, which is not feminist at all, right? So, and actually, it's actually why even in my own kind of work, I was very, I've always been very interested in the co-option of the feminist language, right? Lots and lots of emphasis on empowerment. Why? Because that's easy to sell. But that's where the whole smart economics comes from, right? Which is, oh, I don't just invest in women because then if I invest in women, they feed their children and it's good for their community. It's good for the economy. And now women are going to solve everything. They're going to solve terrorism and world peace and climate change. And so, so in a way, what you end up with is just this language of feminism that is completely devoid of any kind of collaborative or insurgent or revolutionary collective meaning at all. And all it's doing is signaling to the world that it's trying to signal rather that we can use some really clever words to sound like we're, you know, thinking in this more progressive way, but actually the whole bones of what we do isn't really going to change. Why we're not going to commission fewer weapons or, you know, fight in fewer wars or whatever. And so we only even need to look intersectionally at what happened at the border in Ukraine when black and brown bodies were not allowed to cross the border into Poland to see to see the ways in which those ideas just don't filter into the practice. Like in, in the immediate, this is like months ago in the ways in which there was no pressure. We know that there are those people that did manage, you know, to leave Ukraine and, and, and actually displaced within the European Union um, as refugee, but not getting the refugee protections that the, that Ukrainian uh, white Ukrainian people did. So it's just, it's just, a, yeah, it's so cynical actually. And that's what makes me sad about it, because it doesn't need to be. It doesn't have to, you know, it could be meaningful if you had people who were willing, willing to meaningfully engage, but they're not. It's just a shorthand for, oh, we're liberating the women of Afghanistan. That makes us feminist. And neither of those things are true. So, you know. Um, but I don't know if, Vanessa, you wanted to come back on that. No, thank you. I think due to time, I mean, there's obviously much, much to say on this also with regards to intersectionality. I think with that, we really have, because it has become such an empty word, it was part of a liberal um, law framework anyhow, but people also do very different things with intersectionality. So I find it really important to look what are people actually doing instead of having always these debates around the world, word or concept, you know, because people use it very differently with regards to the analysis, but also with regards to, 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 the, to their material struggles. So I think that's important. And like you already said, we, there's a whole genealogy of the kind of, I don't, of, of kind of using this language um, or even feminist or gender development or what have you to actually perpetuate um, um, late capitalist war projects 
as well as development projects as the kind of other side of that, right? So I think if we think this as more of this two sides of one coin, um, then we can actually see that obviously we have to push back against that. But I think also Uta, the question of what can we steal and there maybe the question of abolitionist reforms and non-reformist reforms can, can help because we have to think hard how do we count what are possibilities for redistributions what are the kind of commissions we can go on to really push for things right because no one is outside of this particularly when we're talking about people working in these institutions that it's really important to be strategic and to be also in constant conversation um, with movements and and people actually shaping that work now i know that there are um three other um um questions and 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 um and um, comments in the chat. So I will try to do justice to them and hope that people can stay a bit longer because we started, I think, 10 to 15 minutes um, late and I will try to pull them together. So um, one a question that's um, a, a question by Antje, who is actually saying that there is not so much space even to have the, to ask these kind of questions and to have these um, conversations about what it would actually mean to leave or to radically reimagine um, um, this this kind of work. Um, so, what are your experiences, Slata, with, with with regard to where can these spaces be? Where do you find these spaces to radically reimagine and to have this conversation? And maybe if you could briefly respond to that, I will try to pull the other two questions together that I'm seeing here. Sorry, can I just clarify? So is this about where we do this work? Yeah, in terms of because there's often, I think, no space, but I think we can also bring in their time. I hope that's also yeah. important because often in our everyday, there's in the institutions, yeah. often not even the space to raise these questions, yeah. often also not the time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, where do you find actually these spaces or how do you co-build them with others? Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it, in a way, I, I think we're in actually a very... Ironically, it feels a bit doom and gloom, this talk, which it didn't. In, I, I always feel a bit like doom and gloom in the sense I always come at these sorts of spaces sort of thinking, well, here are the things we need to think about. I think in some ways we were actually a very fertile moment for this kind of activism. Right. So there's lots of pushback in Germany, as far as I'm aware, from colleagues like Adam and Julia Schoenberg and others who are sort of coming together, you know, pushing back against, say, you know, um, AFD and 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 there's those sorts of mobilizations that are occurring pro refugee mobilizations. Um, France is in an uproar about the rise in the state pension age, and that is a mobilization bringing together many disparate groups around a singular kind of uh, moment. In the UK, again, this is not a country that historically has has very you know especially um, after sort of Thatcher and Reagan a huge decline in trade union membership, and yet most of the public sector is on strike at the moment, just rolling strikes for the last six months. I think my my plea in a way has always been about developing a joined up thinking. And here I know Aram is very much somebody who has written extensively about this. So if you haven't already, you should go and look up Aram Ziai's work in addition to Vanessa's work. Um, if you bring those two together, I think you'll all be in a very good place. Um, but just this idea of collapsing, not just north-south boundaries, but doing some joined up thinking around the shared concerns that different movements have. So in a way, I think the way we create those spaces is actually joining up the dots in the work that we already do. So one of the things um, I'm always concerned about is the way in which even notions of development, other the challenges that that groups have in different er in different geographical places, get completely delinked to very similar challenges that people might be facing in, say, the global north. Right? I would love some joined up thinking around like global homelessness. Is it really the case that actually the forces that drive people into homelessness in the UK or Europe in the in Northern Europe, even because even there's a north south divide within Europe. So let's just take Northern Europe as the locus, even though the UK is not technically in the EU anymore. But let's just put that to one side. If we look at sort of the world's richest country, 
right? And you don't have to take my word for it, right? So the UN's uh, special rapporteur on poverty housing went to the US and did the same exercise and was absolutely shocked at the drivers and causes of homelessness, right? Are you really trying to tell me that those drivers and causes are actually that different to the drivers of homelessness in the so-called global south? So actually, what would it take to join those dots up? Right. So for me, I think the danger is in thinking that we need new spaces. I don't think we need new spaces. What we need is to start joining those dots. And that's why I think coloniality is a really useful lens, because what it allows us to do is to look at the structural causes that drive very similar outcomes across different parts of the world. So I can actually then say, hang on a second. So I've got homelessness on the edges of big cities, but it's not just, you know, New Delhi or Bangkok or, you know, Johannesburg. Actually, it's also LA, it's Washington, it's Toronto, it's London, it's Berlin. And actually, I'm not saying there aren't context specific things going on, different governance regimes, including the welfare capitalism that you talked about, Vanessa, quite rightly, that's led to quite a high, a good, that's led to some sort of um, a social contract that makes more people's you know, live longer and all of that. It's a social contract that's breaking down, right? Welfare states are retrenching at quite a dramatic rate now, even in the Nordic countries that are always held up as the best example. But we need to do that joined up thinking. That's the only way. There's lots of this movement building going on. But what would it mean to take those workers' struggles and trade unions that are already active, joining that up with the activism, um, that is sort of trying to think about, say, anti-poverty, doing that across geographical boundaries so that we're much more strategic and focused and sort of actually saying which, which forms of governance are driving that outcome. And I think we'd find a lot more in common across those geographical boundaries because I don't think this system's actually producing very different outcomes in, very, in what would look at least theoretically very diverse geopolitical context. I don't think so. Right. How we respond is different, but yeah. Thank you so much, Lata, for really also stressing this necessity of international analysis in in terms of movement. I think this is crucial um, for particularly also for for strengthening um, the radical transformative also potential and ties. I would like to uh, give briefly. I know Lian and Inga are both going to uh, speak. Um, with their cameras on. Um, I'll head it over to, to Leon first and then Inga, please. And then, um, yeah. Um, and so if you could, um, yeah, no, we, we, we're all a bit over time, but I think, I, I do hope people can stay a bit longer um, for us. Um, and yeah, the, the um, Leon, you first, and then we'll hand it over to Inga immediately. And then maybe Lata, you can speak on both of these questions. Thank you. Ya, uh, terima kasih banyak. Saya akan berbicara dalam bahasa Thank Indonesia. Thank you very much. I would like to speak Indonesian. Thank you very much to Lata and Vanessa. This was a very unique discussion. It was extraordinary. You both explained the process of colonialism and that it is also rooted in language and that it also has an impact on language and language also has an impact on our structures and on our everyday lives. And I was very inspired by that. Lata, you also said with the quote from Nelson Mandela and Lata, you also explained that we are often expected to comply with international conventions and requirements to speak English, for instance. And this is a problem. This is also one big challenge for the concept of development in Indonesia. And we in POSO are starting in our local region where we have violent fights and struggles. We are starting to talk about what is peace? How can we achieve peace? 
but before that we have to really talk to one another it's not a question for only the government or the military it is something that we have to do locally with the people in the community those are the programs that we are promoting and that we are doing with our NGOs we want to strengthen and change the culture in the region and this is a grassroots movement we want to do that locally from the bottom up and we want to stick to our tradition for instance the term or the word peace was actually taken away from us but now we create this word again we reclaim that work we are separating ourselves from the expectations of the government and the military. We make a distinction. We say, okay, this is the local government, this is the military, and this is the community. So we also try to develop our own language. And we also use our local language in order to identify ourselves. So we also talk about language, we identify language, and we also analyze the language of development aid. And then we want to, to express that with our language, with our mother tongue, those local languages that are used in our region. There are many different processes going on, and they are also changing the structures and the systems and the everyday lives of the people. And I'm very much interested in this topic, in this topic of language and how we use language. So I liked your presentation very much because this is also what we experience ourselves. And we also see decolonization and that it has to take place very close to the people. Decolonization has to be managed and controlled by the people, by locals. It cannot be controlled and managed by those people who are talking the development language. It's us. We have to do that in the region. And we see that language plays a very strong role here. And we are also cooperating with the women in the villages. We have a school for the village renewal, where we want to build up the village again. And we also talk about what is the importance of wealth, of welfare, of development. So we are actually defining the terms. We are defining our objectives and what we want to achieve. Because the suggestions of the government are actually indicators that are not linked to our culture. Those are Western indications, Western indicators. So that means that we are actually creating structures ourselves that are owned by us. This is just something that I wanted to share with you. I just wanted to tell you what we are doing in our region where we actually want to do local decolonization. Thank you so, so much, Leanne, for, for, for highlighting this and sharing this because I really strongly show I now hear the translation. I have to, uh, something is... Right. Um, yeah, um, because it really, I think, shows right how you how you saying that people are actually struggling to 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 engage with these projects as projects of ordinary people, and they have to be grounded in the lived realities um, of of people to really make radical change. And that sometimes means even pushing back the liberal language. Often means pushing back the liberal language of development. I know that the translators have to leave at 2:20 p.m. So I would like to pull up Inga's um, question. And Inga, I would brief, uh, please ask you uh, to brief as be as brief as possible because at 20 after two, um, the translators have to leave. Then I will hand it over to Lata again, 
And then uh, we're going to do the closing. And I just wanted to briefly also mention that obviously also people have been contributing to these questions um, in the chat, like Wolfgang has also mentioned the role of colonial languages. Um, here, Antje has been uh, also mentioning that oft there is the will, but then actually people also withdraw. So I think this really also comes back around the question of having more conversations and also strategies. Um, and Inga would like to speak briefly, raise a point uh, also with their camera on, I think. I or audio on. Yes, I tried to turn my camera on. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, I'll be speaking in English. And unfortunately, I don't have a very specific question to ask. I was more kind of trying to open up um, a space because you, Vanessa, mentioned earlier depth cancellation as um, a possible example for an evolutionist reform. And I'm very interested in that topic. And I was wondering if um, time permits to hear more of your and Lata's thoughts on the topic, possibly in relation to movements that are gaining popularity right now, such as depth for climate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is obviously related to this. I just mentioned this as one important strategy because we know also from the work of Veronica Gago and many, many others that particularly in context of Latin America, but obviously not only debt, not just the question of labor is crucial, right? But the question of people becoming surplus in, in, in terms of people, uh, the debtification if you will, right? The depthification of the poor, of the working class, of the working poor is becoming increasingly a role, but it was already in the 80s when Thomas Sankara was actually pointing that and trying to mobilize um, uh, formerly colonized countries to not pay back debt, right? And to even not engage with this. So I think that is a crucial crystallization point of mobilization. Um, and obviously not just in the so-called countries of the, of the global uh, South, but it's also a kind of mechanism to control people and to let them be in poverty. So I think there's much mobilization potential here with regards to the climate question. But I hand it over to you, Lata, for, um, our final roundup, and maybe you can also briefly um, respond to Leanne and maybe have something sure. to say on the question of, 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 of that that Inga raised. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, so Leanne, I can't say anything apart from I'm going to have to connect with you afterwards and learn more about what you're doing. It sounds wonderful and there's lots to learn. And I know we've only got a few minutes before interpreters have to go. So the only thing I would say is what is so striking about what you're saying is there is lit in, in the thing that we call <clears throat> the aid and development architecture, <clears throat> there is no mechanism for your experience to be globalized. That for me is, is, is absolutely a, 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 a big barrier for, for all of us. There is no mechanism for us to learn what you're doing because you are not talking in English you are you're 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 the local so it's all fine if you all talk to each other but the starting assumption is that we all have nothing to learn from what you've just said now i know that in this room that's not a shared view but outside this room it very much is so that's our challenge what does it take for what you've just shared with us leanne to become part of a global conversation where we step back and go okay who are we not listening to and how do we learn from them maybe moving outside of our comfort zones, whether that's language, governance structures, whatever. So that I, so I, I'm, I am gonna have to come back to you, Leanne, and learn more about what you're doing. Thank you for sharing. It sounds incredibly inspirational, shared vocabularies. It's also super important and I cannot do justice to what you've shared with us, but I really appreciate you sharing it. Thank you so much. But we need to work out how you globalize that. How do you become global experts on that? There's just no mechanism to do it. On the question of debt, the only thing I would say is we're always rewriting those rules to suit our circumstances. So I only recently learned that the Marshall Plan that bailed out Europe also entailed quite a large element of debt forgiveness. But debt is a form of discipline. If you can keep people poor, then they are dependent on um, um, their labor, it's a disciplining mechanism. Um, they're less likely to fight for rights because they can't survive. Like debt is a disciplining mechanism, both at an individual and a group level. And we can see that playing out in quite cynical ways in terms of how in the UK, we can see it at the moment. I mean, the anti-trade union rhetoric is just through the roof. I mean, it is, it is not surprising, but it's quite extraordinary the way people talk about it because collective bargaining power 
is such is such an exception to how we think about the ways in which um, power is expressed. There is no expression of power from below. So debt relief is actually an obvious thing to do. Like it's the obvious first thing to do. It frees up resources. It'll increase demand. You can pump that back into the economy. You can, you know, improve serve. Like it, it's it's a no brainer and it has a history. It's not even a new thing that people are asking for. It's just that actually the so-called global south in a kind of form of dependence, sort of convenience for the way the global convenient for the way the global governance works. But I'll, I'll leave it there and just to say, I feel like we've really we've really started to have a wonderful conversation. There's never enough time. I'm extremely grateful for to Medico International for inviting me to share a space with all of you to give me absurd amounts of time to share some of my own perspectives, which, you know, it's not because they're any more worthwhile. It just happened to be in that position. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you for listening to Vanessa for your uh, kind comments, but also incredibly uh, thoughtful uh, provocations as well. And I'm so inspired by your work. So it's a really um, amazing uh, thing to be able to share the space with you today. Um, but I'll turn back to the moderators and just thank you so much. I hope it's the start of a much longer conversation, not just for Medico, but for the whole sort of networks of people that it includes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lata, so much for your really generative, thought provoking and like really radical also invitation and offerings and reflection. This was amazing. Thank you to, to Medico, uh, to all the participants, to, to Lian and Radwa who actually conceptualized um, this series for the lively discussion. And I think it really showed that we, that we have to move not only beyond um, development, but maybe abolish it towards radical solidarity. And that this is also grounded in um, actually having these conversations being in touch, being in grounded and connected, and also thinking about what kind of institutions we actually need, because often we cannot even have these institutions, because many of them were also crushed as a part of um, actually attacks against solidarity. So we thank you all, and um, we wish you a, a good rest of the day, evening, um, and um, please take care. And um... Can we just also say thank you to Leanne as a co-organizer? Oh, yes, I did to Radva and Leanne for, for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that as well uh, to, to Leanne for the core. But also, just to say is also it's really nice that translation was made available. This yeah. is also in terms of how we should do this better. I think there's been a really good model. So thank you uh, to to Medico and, and Leanne and colleagues in India. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And also to the interpreters, exactly as Lata said, for putting this together and making this possible. Thank you.